I want to work through an example of using forces and free body diagrams to analyze motion in a circle that is vertically oriented. A circle in a vertical plane, so it's like going around a loop like this, in particular a roller coaster, going around that vertical loop. And the specific example I'm going to look at here is one of those fun ones where if you're not going fast enough, the people in the roller coaster are going to plunge to a horrible doom. Uh, at least if you don't have good engineers around to put safety features in. We're going to count purely on the laws of physics and lack of little mistakes or unexpected surprises, and we're going to try to see how fast we need to be going for this uh, when the roller coaster goes over the top to avoid falling off of the track. So, okay, how are we going to analyze that? Well, a good place to start is just to draw free body diagrams. And uh, just for comparison's sake, I'm going to draw a diagram for the cart at the bottom of the circle and another one for the cart at the top just to see what that looks like. Uh, so I will draw the bottom position. And there I can look at this. My cart is only touching the ground at one point on the bottom, or touching something at one point. Well, I guess each wheel is a point. We're treating it as a single contact with the, with the track. And so that contact means that there's a normal force, normal force going upward, and then that's the only contact force. We're going to ignore friction. We're going to say we have some good wheels on here and it's not going to be slowing down or anything. And then we've got a gravitational force, a long range force, the force of gravity pulling down on the cart. And that's what we've got for the free body diagram at that location. Now, I should also, as part of any free body diagram, I like to draw to the side the acceleration vector at that point. Here, the cart is beginning to be in this circular motion. It's in a motion around the circle, and as we've seen, for circular motion, the acceleration always points toward the center of the circle. So in this case, that's above my cart, so my acceleration vector all draws a little double arrow off to the side, pointing up. And having done all this, it's pretty clear to me that a traditional coordinate system where plus y is vertically upward is going to be a natural fit for this situation. Similarly, I can draw a free body diagram for this cart being at the top of the circle. And there, let's see, at this position, I have, again, one contact point or con set of contact points between the cart and the track. And as usual, that means there's a normal force. Normal forces are always directed perpendicular to the surface, normal to the surface, and away from the surface. For us, that means the normal force points down. The normal force has to point down at that position. Long range force of gravity also points down. And so I guess it's not too surprising, then looking at those forces, that the acceleration in a circular motion goes toward the center, which is also going to be down. So I will include my acceleration vector over here as a downward acceleration vector. And once again, I can look at these and say, well, it's all oriented this way. I'm going to go ahead and choose plus y going vertically up, though if you chose plus y going down, I guess I wouldn't blame you too much. But the traditional choice fits pretty well here, and since, since it's familiar, we'll use it. Okay, I've drawn these free body diagrams. What do I do next? Well, hopefully you can hear a voice chanting in your head saying, you just finished a free body diagram, write down Newton's second law in components. So I'll do that with this bottom one first, just to give, an idea, give us an introduction. This is the less interesting one, since Hopefully we're not going to fall off the bottom of the track, but we'll try it. So, Newton's second law for the bottom. We know that Fy net is equal to the mass of the cart times the y component of acceleration. That's Newton's second law. And the y forces, I guess this is equal to, I'll go ahead and just jump straight to putting the plus and minus signs in. Uh, I know the normal force is in the positive y direction, and it's all that way, no sines and cosines in any of this. And the gravitational force is in the minus y direction. I'll go ahead and write this as minus mg, just to have the mg magnitude of the gravitational force in there. My y acceleration, this is equal to mass times, and for acceleration, this is in the positive y direction, so I guess I should put a plus in here. Uh, mass times for acceleration in circular motion, we know that if you're going constant speed in circular motion, your acceleration is v squared divided by the radius r of the circle. So there we go. I've got that. Whatever 
y speed is here, you can immediately conclude from this that the normal force is going to be equal to mg plus mv squared over r. And that's clearly going to be some positive number. And the normal force is going to be whatever it takes to hold you up against gravity plus whatever it takes to additionally bend the motion of the cart up into the circular pattern. That makes sense. That's, that's then the normal force is holding you up and then also pushing the cart up around the loop. Sensible enough for the bottom. Now let's look at the top point. That if we look at this top free body diagram and set that up. Uh, so again, I'm going to draw do the same thing. My Fy net is equal to mass times Ay. And I'll go through just piece by piece again. My normal force is in the minus direction. So that's minus normal force, Fn, minus mg again, which is also in the negative direction. And that's equal to my Ay is also in the negative direction. So that's going to be minus m times v squared over r. Same v squared over r, but this time it's pointing down. OK, so hopefully that makes some sense. And I guess then I can do the same thing I did before and observe here, if I want Fn by itself, I will get that my normal force is equal to solving, uh, move things around, I'll get mv squared over r minus mg. Or if I want to think of it that way, it's equal to mass times v squared over r minus g. That's my normal force. I've used Newton's second law. I've come up with this answer. Now, what's this do for me? What am I, what am I supposed to be doing with this, with this answer? I've, I've, I've solved for normal force almost out of reflex because it's the one unknown. I guess normal force and v are both unknowns. This is giving me a way of thinking about it, at least, of conceptualizing this. What I want is to know how fast I need to be going to make a loop. I, I have the sense that if I just tried to sit still at the top, I would fall for sure. But if I'm going really fast, I'll whip around and hold on. So where is that balancing point? Where is that equality? And the key idea, the, the key relationship that shows up here is that the moment when you just barely lose contact with a surface, in general, in any physics problem, the moment when you barely lose contact with a surface is synonymous with the normal force for that surface equaling zero. You can imagine that if you have two surfaces pressed together, right? if I have two surfaces pressed together and they gradually push less and less and less, the moment where they lose contact, the normal force just stopped and then opened up. And then they separate. If they're separated, you have to draw a different free body diagram that doesn't have the contact in it. But if they are touching, but about to stop touching, that's the free body diagram that has the normal force in it, but has normal force equals zero. That's the criterion we'll always use for this sort of case. So if that's my criterion, you can see there's going to be a place where that happens, right? There's a minus sign on the right-hand side. When the normal force is zero, that's when these two terms are going to cancel out. So in particular, if Fn equals zero, that tells me that zero has to equal v squared over r minus g. Uh, I divided both sides by m to simplify a little bit because the mass is not good. That, well, the mass could be zero too, but that's not what we're getting at here. We've got a, it's a roller coaster. It's not massless. So v squared over r minus g equals zero. That's easy to solve. That just tells me that v is equal to plus or minus, but I'm looking at a magnitude here, um, the square root of g times r. For us, that means v equals the square root of 9.8 meters per second squared times, what's my radius? Well, I specified in the picture the diameter of this loop is 20.4 meters which might be big, but it's 20.4 20 meters, so my radius then is 10.2 meters. And by clever construction, this happens to come out to be very close to the square root of 100, about 10 times 10, right, meters squared 
per second squared, which is just 10 meters per second. So that's the speed I would need to be going to make it around this roller coaster loop. Uh, to, to, right, this is the speed I'd need to be going at the top to make it around without falling. The fun thing is you could try this at every angle, at any given position around here. You could try it on the side and say how fast do I need to be moving over on the side to avoid, uh, to avoid uh, falling off there. Again, the side you're not going to fall off because there's track underneath you, but you could keep going at different angles and say, as a function of angle, what speed do I need? Clearly the top is going to be the most dangerous place, so that's the one that I usually check. Also, it's easier because you don't need to worry about forces along your direction of motion speeding you up and slowing you down. That's our story. Uh, v equals 10 meters per second, and I hope that you can see where this came from. It comes entirely from drawing the free body diagram, knowing the normal force is down, which is unfamiliar but true, drawing the free body diagram, drawing the acceleration vector in, in the correct direction toward the center, and knowing acceleration is v squared over r. And when you put those pieces together, there you have it. You can solve for the necessary speed.